Okay, so we're going to go through every question that has been asked, and we're going to start off with number, rounding, and estimation. Now, quick little thing, this doesn't include papers that are beyond summer 2020, because these are currently locked by Excel, so it's all of the ones that have been released up until this point. So, all of the questions on rounding and estimation. There are two kinds of questions here. We've got estimating answers, and we've got error intervals, and we're going to begin with estimating answers. So this first question, taken from summer 2019, it's non-calculator. It just says to work out an estimate for the value of this particular calculation that we've got here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to round some of these things to try and make it a little bit easier. Well, I think this 63.5, I know a square number that's really close to that, so I'm actually going to round that 63.5 to 64. And then I'm going to round the 100 to an, sorry the 101.7 to another square number that I know which is close by, which is 100. Now you can either find the square root of these things separately, or you could multiply them and then find the square root. So when you multiply them, you get 6,400. You now just need to think of two numbers that multiply to give that. Well, we know that it's going to have something to do with an 8, because the square root of 64 is 8. And it's actually going to be 80, because if you think about doing 80 times 80, the 8 times the 8 gives you the 64 with the extra two zeros. So an estimated answer for this is just going to be 80. To check the mark scheme, yeah, they would have accepted anything between 75 and 81 for this, and you do get one mark for just doing some type of rounding to begin with. Okay, the next question that we've got here, this one is from a non-calculator paper as well. So it says that a cone has a volume of 98 centimetres cubed, and the radius of the cone is 5.13 centimetres. Work out an estimate for the height of the cone, and they've given us the formula for it as well. So when it says estimate, we're going to round these things to one significant figure. So I'm going to say that the volume would round to 900, uh, to not 900, to 100 centimetres cubed. And I'm going to say that the radius is just going to round to 5 centimetres. So substituting things into the formula, the volume is 100, and we're going to have a third. Now, they've mentioned pi. We know that pi is actually 3.14159. So if I'm going to round that just to um, one significant figure, I'm just going to round that to a 3, which we're allowed to do for these kinds of questions. We're going to then multiply by the radius squared, and the radius squared is 5 squared and then that gets multiplied by the height. So thinking about what happens here, the third times the three is just one. So we get 100 equals one multiplied by five squared, which is 25, and we have the height there as well. So what we need to do is we solve this equation by doing 100 divided by 25, and 100 by 25 is four. So an estimate for our height of the cone here is going to be four centimeters. It then says for part B that John uses calculator to work out the height of the cone to two decimal places. Will our estimate be more than John's answer or less than John's answer? Give reasons for your answer. Well, let's have a look at the calculation and see what we did here. So for the top part, we rounded up. I'm not going to write round. I'm just going to write for the top part, we rounded it up. And for the bottom part, we rounded it down. If you think about making the numerator bigger and the denominator bigger, then our estimation is actually going to be an overestimate because this bit on the bottom, the top is bigger and the bottom is smaller. That corresponds to an overestimate. So our answer is going to be more than John's. And the reason why is because we rounded the numerator up and the denominator down. Okay, let's check that we got this correct. So for this kind of question, they're going to accept a range of answers between 3.5 and 4.5, and we are correct with it being more, and we've said it's more since the number in the numerator goes up and the numbers in the denominator go down for that. Okay, let's see the next one we've got. It's also a non-calculator one. And this is estimating answers with speed, distance, time. So a cycle race across America is 3,069.25 miles in length. Juan knows his average speed for the previous races is 15.12 miles per hour. For the next race across America, he will cycle for eight hours per day estimate how many days it will take him to complete the race. So the key word is going to be estimate, and that means that we can do some rounding here. So instead of doing this particular part, I'm just going to round that to 3,000 miles to make it nice and easy. And instead of doing the 15.12 miles, I'm just going to round that speed to 15 miles. You could, if you want to, round it to 20 to one significant figure, but I think dividing it by uh, 15 probably is going to be sensible here. 
So I'm not going to worry about this eight hours per day for the moment. I'll have a look at that in just a second. Now we know that the time is the distance divided by the speed. So putting those values in, our distance is 3000 and our speed is 15. So if I do how many times 15 goes into 3000, 15 goes into 30 twice, and then there's those two extra zeros. So we get that the time is 200 hours. Now we can use this extra piece of information that he's cycling for eight hours per day. So I'm going to do 200 divided by eight to find out how many days that will be. So I'm gonna do eight goes into 20, eight goes into 20 twice, remainder four, and eight goes into 40 five times. So it looks like we're gonna suggest that there are going to be 25 days that it will take for him to complete the race. It then says for part B that Juan trains for the race. The average speed he can cycle at increases. It is now 16.27 miles per hour. So it's important to note that he is now going to be cycling faster. Well, if someone is, taking, is cycling at a faster rate, that should mean that they are gonna take less time, so it should be fewer days. So how does this affect your answer to part A? It will decrease the number of days. It might not, but it's the most sensible one. It might end up being 25 days, but because we've made him go faster, it's gonna do a decrease. Let's see what we have in the mark scheme here. So for the estimated value, there's lots of different ones that they would accept, but the one that they're really suggesting here is with all of your own rounding, 25 is gonna work, but they do say any correct answer following through from their round rounded values. And the explanation they've suggested is less days are required. You could have said though, it doesn't affect the answer because you'd still round the 16.27 down to 15 or you'd still round it to 20. So it might not actually have changed what went on in your calculations. Okay, let's have a look at this one here, which is also about speed distance time. So it says that a plane travels at a speed of 213 miles per hour, and we want to work out an estimate for the number of seconds it takes to travel one mile. Well, I guess the way I think about this one instead is if we have that the speed this time is 200, let's round this speed to 200 miles per hour. And we've got here that the number of seconds to travel one mile. So the distance is going to be one mile. Now we know that the time taken is the speed divided by the distance. And the speed divided by the distance is 200. That doesn't make sense. It's not the speed divided by the distance. It's the distance divided by the speed. It is the distance divided by the speed or one divided by 200. Now this is in hours. So we're gonna to need to do some calculations here to make this work. Um, to go from hours to minutes, because it wants it in seconds, first of all, we're gonna to have to multiply it by 60 so that it becomes in minutes. And then to get it in seconds, I'm gonna to need to multiply it by 60 again. So 60 times 60, the six times six is 36 with the two extra zeros. So we get 3,600 divided by 200 seconds. So we've had to do some conversions here. So the time is equal to all of these things. Now I'm gonna do this last part as a division. I'm gonna do my 3,600 divided by 200. Well, actually I can cancel the zeros. It's actually just 36 divided by two and 36 divided by two is 18 seconds. And then it says, is our answer an underestimate or an overestimate? Give a reason for your answer. Well, the key thing that we actually rounded here was the speed and we made the plane go slower. So because we're making the plane go slower, I think we have actually underestimated how fast this is going. Because if the plane is going slower, we're saying that it will take 18 seconds to go one mile. Um, if the plane was in reality going even faster than that, it should take even quicker. So we're gonna say that this is an overestimate. And this is because we rounded the speed down. Okay, let's check that we've got this right. So 18 seconds between 16 and 20, that's pretty good. And we've said it's an overestimate as the speed is rounded down, which was mentioned here. 
Okay, next questions that we've got are actually looking at error intervals. So this is kind of like a subtopic of rounding and estimation. Here it says that number n is rounded to two decimal places and the result is 4.76. Using inequalities, write down the error interval for n. So you're going to start off with n in the middle and we're going to think what's the lowest thing that it could be that would round to 4.76. Well, 4.755 is definitely going to round up. I'm going to put that sign in in just a second. If you imagine this being rounded to two decimal places, that 5 is going to make it round up. However, if we had 4.754, that would round down, so we don't want to include that one. Now, we are actually going to include that 7.555, which is why I'm going to use this symbol here. I'm going to say that it's got to be bigger than that, but it could also be equal to that. Now we're just going to think, what number does it have to be less than? Well, 4.765, if it was 4.765, it would round up to 4.77. But I'm saying it's got to be less than that. So anything that's less than 4.765 is indeed going to round to 4.76. So let's check that we've got this right. We've got your 4.755 and your 4.765. That's great. OK, we've got a reciprocal question here, which is kind of not related, but part B is a rounding and estimation. So it's a calculator paper. It says find the reciprocal of 1.6. That just means do 1 divided by the number you want to find the reciprocal of. So on my calculator I've got here, I actually had that one already. I'm going to do 1 divided by 1.6. And we can see that our answer as a decimal is 0.625, 0.625. Jess rounds the number x to one decimal place. The result is 9.8. We're going to write down the error interval for x. So we're always going to set it up with these kinds of symbols for this sort of um, one decimal place rounding. It's got to be less than 0.985 because anything um, below 0.985 is going to go down to 9.8. And at this end, it's 0.975. You've got to be really careful with your, these inequality signs. This one, it could be equal to. This one, it has to be less than. So we've got our 0.625 and those two that we have here as well. OK, this time it is truncating the number. Now, in case you're not sure what truncating is, um, it just means cutting off all of the digits. So, for example, if you had this number here and you truncated it to one digit, it just means cut off all of that bit that you've got there. But also, if you had this number, it just would say cut off after that first digit and just get rid of everything so that you're only left with one digit. So this time, the error interval is going to be a bit different for n. It definitely is going to have the smallest as 7. If you cut off all of the numbers after 7, well, there's nothing even there to cut off. And this time, it has to be less than 8. If you think of a number that's less than 8, it's always going to be 7.999 something. So when we truncate that, we are going to be less than 7. You'll notice I don't have the or equal to sign there, because if I said it was equal to 8, when you truncate that, you're not going to have it there at all. Uh, when you truncate that, you're going to start with an 8, I mean. OK, let's just erase this. So it's just going to be this error interval just between 7 and 8 here. OK, this time we have something that doesn't really say if it's a rounding or a truncation, but it says that Sally used her calculator to work out the value of a number y. The answer on her calculator display began 8.3. So this is actually an example of truncating. OK, the rest of the numbers, we've just ignored them. So the smallest thing that it could be is 8.3. And the biggest thing that it could be if it starts with 8.3 is the biggest thing it could be is 8.4. Now, I know that sounds silly, but we're saying it's less than 8.4 which would be 8.39999. So when we truncate those bits at the end, those nines, we do get left with 8.3. So it's going to be between 8.3 and 8.4 that you can see in the mark scheme. OK, we have got an error interval here. This time it's something that's being rounded to the nearest millimetre. So I'm going to go a little bit quicker here. The lowest end of this is going to be 127.5, and then we have 128.5 for the upper limit for this part, for the error interval. So it's between 127.5 and 128.5. We have a, another error interval. This is something being rounded to one decimal place, and the result is 9.4. So the lower end is going to be 9.35, and the upper end is 9.45 for this. You can kind of see how you bump it down by 0.5 and bump it up by 0.5 as well. And these are our two answers here. 
So that's the end of all of the questions that have been asked on rounding and estimation. If you're following along with this, the next up is going to be calculations, which is mostly about how to use your calculator. Do make sure that you're subscribed to my channel because there's going to be loads of tutorial videos. And I'm also going to be going through this entire document, which is linked in the description so that you have all the exam questions that you need to help you with your revision and getting prepared for your exams.